Okay. But you notice that this, is, this, this proof is an indirect proof, um, and it doesn't tell you. Um, and so this is the usual problem with, with pure mathematics. Right? You, if some, you prove something exists or is unique, but you don't get an algorithm to find it. Um, um, well, actually, you do get an algorithm, but as you'll see, it's, 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 it's a lousy algorithm. Um, the, um, um, another way to interpret that argument, if you push it a bit further, it tells you that, in fact, um, if x is sparse and you want to solve a x equals b, then x can actually be recovered, and the, the formula for recovery is what you do is that you take, the, um, you take all solutions to a x equals b, and you pick the sparsest one. Okay, so um, if you have an s sparse solution, then you, you take among all solutions to x equals b, you minimize the sparsity, which is called the L0 norm. So you, you may be familiar with the L1 and L2 norms and so forth, the LP norms. There's also the L, L0 norm, which is not so, so common, but the, uh, the L0 norm of a function is just the sum of the zeroth powers of the coefficients, which is the same as, as the number of non-zero elements. You know, zero to zero is one. Um, so the, um, the L0 norm is the number of um, non-zero entries. It's the sparsity of x. And the previous lemma says that you can't have two sparse solutions to the same problem. So once you find one solution which is sparse, that is the sparsest solution um, to the problem. So, um, um, yeah, so if you have a, if you have a sparse um, data solving x equals b, you can reconstruct it by finding, looking at all solutions x equals b, and among all solutions, finding the sparsest one. Okay? So that is the algorithm that works. Right, compared with the algorithm that doesn't work, which is least squares, which is very similar, but instead of minimizing L0, you minimize L2. Okay, that is least squares. It doesn't work in these applications, but you have, you have uh, the L0 minimization, which does work. Okay. But there's a major problem, unfortunately. Um, ah, okay, yeah. Um, actually, before I do that, uh, let me show you a picture. Um, Okay, so uh, this is a picture that might, might clarify what's going on. So um, th this space, this is the, the data space, the space of all x's. So um, uh, this should be n-dimensional. So it should, in practice, it should be million-dimensional, but I can't display a million-dimensional space on this computer screen. So I'm just displaying a two-dimensional space. Okay, so um, this, is, this, this is a much reduced uh, picture, which, which, but you should, it still conveys the basic idea. Um, so you have, you have two-dimensional um, data space. So your space has two coefficients. The points which are on these axes are the sparse data. Okay, so if you're on this axis or this axis, then you, um, we have, you're one sparse. You have on, only one quotient on zero. Okay, and if you're solving some equation a equals b, then you're, you're restricting your solution to just lie on, on, um, on a subspace like this, this, this blue line here. Okay, so this is the true, so suppose you have some sparse data. Here's your sparse data. You take some measurement. And this measurement tells you, okay, and, and then given b, you want to reconstruct x, but, but all you know about x is that it lies on this, on this, um, um, on this line. If you take least squares, uh, what least squares does is um, it minimizes the norm, uh, it minimizes the L2 norm, which, and one way to think about that is that you, you take the, um, the Euclidean ball, the L2 ball, and you, you, you grow it from the origin until it first touches uh, this space. And the, the, points, the place of first contact, that's the least squares of a solution. Okay, everybody else on this line has a bigger L2 norm than, than X sharp here. And you can see that X sharp is not equal to X. Okay, that the sparse solution is, is, is not equal to the least square solution. And there's no reason why it should be. Okay, so in general, the least squares solution is not the same as the sparse solution. So you minimize L2, you get this guy. You minimize L0, you get this guy. And that, okay, so minimizing L0 is, uh, gives you the right solution, and L2 does not. Okay, so... Mathematically, the problem is solved. If you want to find uh, the sparse solution, you minimize, you minimize the, the sparsity, which makes a lot of sense. Um, unfortunately, there's a huge problem when you actually try to apply this. Um, no one knows how to, uh, given in linear algebra, how to minimize the sparsity of a solution. In fact, um, if you, this, the general abstract problem of finding the sparsest solution to a linear problem uh, is, uh, is actually, it's, it contains what's called the subset sum problem. And if you know anything about complexity theory, that's an example of an NP-complete problem. Um, and so this problem is an, is, is an exponentially hard problem. If you can solve this problem, you can solve all other problems in the world uh, that are exponentially hard, in, roughly. Um, and uh, you also collect a million dollar prize uh, from the Clay Institute. Uh, and no one knows how to do any of this. Uh, no one knows, in general, how to minimize, the, find the sparsest solution to, to a, a linear problem. Um, 
you can try brute force. So if you, what, if you want to find a sparse solution, you have, you have uh, an S sparse solution. What you can do is that you, uh, um, if, you have, if, you're, if you have n degrees of freedom and, and you have S sparse solution, then there are n choose S possibilities for where the, um, the sparsity is. Uh, so you can iterate for each one of these n choose S possibilities. You, you can assume that you are sparse in a certain, uh, for a specific set of columns, do linear algebra to try to find a solution there. If it doesn't work, you move on to the next one, and so on. That's the brute force search. Um, and this will work, except that in applications with n is one million and s is a thousand, n choose s is like 10, 10 to the 10 to the uh, 10,000. It's just not practical to um, to um, uh, to look search for that at all with, with a computer. It's it's just not. Uh, uh, there's just there's no way, unless you saw p equals mp. But okay. So. Um, all right, so to summarize, we have these, these two approaches. We have L2 minimization, which is very, very quick, it's effective. We have a, it can be done very, very quickly, but it gives the wrong answer. And then there's L0 minimization, which gives the right answer, but is completely impractical. It just takes far too much time. So uh, neither of these two things are the right thing to do. Um, so what we do instead is we split the difference. So instead of L2 minimization or L0 minimization, we take L1 minimization, the uh, thing halfway in between. So the, the L1 norm is not the sum of squares, it's the sum of absolute values of the coefficients. Um, so what you do actually is that you, uh, uh, among all solutions to um, x equals b, you pick the solution which has this, not the sparsest, not the least energy, but the smallest um, L1 magnitude, the smallest sum of, of, of magnitudes. Um, the reason you do this is that the L1 norm, if you learn basic functional analysis, is convex. Uh, and so this is an example of what's called a, comp a convex programming problem. In fact, it's a linear programming problem. And we have a lot of standard linear programming tools, um, the simplex method, for instance, which will solve this, this problem quite, uh, quite efficiently. For, for say, um, when, when, you have, when your data sets are size one million, you can, you can do this in, in about in a couple minutes on a good computer. Um, OK, so this is, this is something that uh, you can do. And it works very well. So uh, to ex before I, I talk about that, let me show you the picture again. OK, so this was L2 minimization, and it gave you the wrong answer. OK. This is L1 minimization. So when you minimize the L1 norm, uh, what you're doing, you, you take the uniborn L1, which uh, in two dimensions is a diamond. Um, in, um, in higher dimensions, it's an octahedron. Um, and you're expanding this diamond to, um, to find the first place where you hit, um, hit your, your, your solution space, Ax equals b. And the thing is that the diamond is much pointier than, than the, the sphere. The L1 ball is much pointier than the sphere. And the points occur when you are sparse. The, the vertices of the L1 norm occur at, at, sparse, um, at sparse vectors. And this is why somehow you're much more likely to hit um, uh, your space at, at a sparse point than at a, um, a non-sparse point. And so in this particular case, you, uh, you, get, you, you, you recover the solution exactly. Now, this is only a two-dimensional model. It's, uh, uh, one thing you learn very quickly in the subject is that high dimension High-dimensional uh, systems are very different from low-dimensional ones. But nevertheless, in this case, at least, um, this, the same principle uh, applies. Um, oh, yeah, OK. So I should say that this, 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 uh, this approach was called basis pursuit. Um, before the mathematicians started studying this problem, I mean, this problem came up uh, naturally in lots of the sciences, like geoscience in particular. Um, you're, you're doing seismology, you are, you're trying to reconstruct some strata um, on, the, on the Earth, and you're taking some spectral measurements, you're bouncing radar waves back and forth, and you have a, a very finite number of measurements, and many, much fewer measurements needed than to reconstruct your, your, your data. But you still want to, to publish a paper where you say, this is what we think the, the structure of the Earth is. Um, and so you have to do something, okay? And uh, they tried least squares, and it gave clearly rubbish results. And so they, they, by, they empirically, they, they, uh, they, they tried this uh, L1 minimization, and it worked. They didn't know why it worked, but it worked very well. Um, nowadays, we know the reason why it worked is for the data, was that um, in seismology, your data is very sparse. You, know, you have these, these strata of rock of one density and another density, and there are these fault lines between them where they, they, there's a transition from one density to another. Um, so the, the, uh, but there are very few transitions. Mostly, you have, you have very homogeneous uh, density, and then there's, uh, every so often, there's a, there's a shock or a transition. So your data is really, in some sense, very sparse. And this is really what, um, uh, okay, after the fact, this, this, is, this is now what we, uh, we, we, we know why, why, why these algorithms worked. 